Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. I'm Tom Banshoff, Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown. And on behalf of our Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Georgetown University Sustainable Oceans Alliance, I'm delighted to welcome you to day two of the Our Ocean, One Future Leadership Summit. It's really wonderful to see such a crowd. So many members of our academic community here, students, faculty, and staff, and represent, representatives of the dipl diplomatic and international community as well. You can see the excitement that's been generated and will be generated into the future around this topic. Our gathering is made possible through an active partnership with the Department of State, which is hosting the third Our Ocean Conference this week with leaders from around the world a conference to catalyze actions to protect our oceans from threats including climate change and pollution, and to empower a new generation of leaders who are mobilizing to preserve the health and resilience of our shared oceans into the future. That new generation is the driving force behind our leadership summit yesterday and today here on campus. The Georgetown Sustainable Oceans Alliance is a remarkable student-led organization and on behalf of our university, I would like to thank Mimi Troxell, Franz Farrell, and their colleagues for spearheading this path-breaking summit, which brings together student leaders with leaders in the field to build strategies that spur action on the threats to our oceans. So please join me in giving our student leaders a round of applause. Before we get started, I would also like to acknowledge the leadership of the Dean of the School of Foreign Service, Joel Hellman, and his staff, as well as our program on science, technology, and international affairs for their vital roles in bringing us together this morning. And I'd like to underscore that today's gathering is one of a series of events this semester supported by the School of Foreign Service and the university's Global Futures Initiative that will explore global environmental challenges and the positive differences that universities can make. As you know, we have a wonderful program for you today. Later this morning, we'll have the opportunity to hear from Secretary of State John Kerry in conversation with actor and environmentalist Adrian Grenier. And to begin today's conversation, I now have the privilege of moderating a panel discussion with four distinguished international leaders in this field to set out some of the critical issues and challenges around oceans from their very different national and global perspectives. This morning, we are delighted to welcome to Georgetown Her, Excell Her Excellency Isabel de Semalo, Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama. Her Excellency Isabella Lovin, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for International Development, Cooperation and Climate of Sweden. Her Excellency Susana Malcora, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship of Argentina and Her Excellency Ségolène Royal, President of the COP21 and Minister for Environment, Energy, and the Sea of France. Thank you, all of you, for being here. <laughs> We're going to begin with Minister Royal, who has played, as you know, a vital leadership role in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and has generously agreed to provide some introductory remarks. The five of us will then continue the conversation on stage with one another and with you through questions posed by the students. So thank you all again for being here, and please join me in welcoming Her Excellency Minister Ségolène Royal. Thank you very much, Professor Banchov, Mr. President, Ministers, Excellencies, and all of you students of Georgetown University. I am very happy to be here. Thank you for giving me this great opportunity to explain to the next generation what our generation is doing to fight climate change. But what we need is your passion, your imagination, your creativity, because you are the ones who will build the future of our planet. And as president of COP21, I would like 
First, to underline the amazing work achieved by the United States and President Obama to help make COP21 a historical success and for having ratified the Paris Agreement two, we two, day two weeks ago. I express... And I express my deepest gratitude to my friend, Secretary of State John Kerry, who has successfully conceived this extremely important conference on the ocean. This conference is a key step after Climate Summit of Paris. And today, I would like quickly to insist on three points. First, why the ocean is so important to, be, to the climate. Second, the new actions of France to protect the ocean. And three, the important steps taken during COP21 in favor of the ocean. The earth is blue, and the ocean is a blue heart of our planet, as scientists said. 70% of the Earth's surface, 96% of its biosphere, and 80% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline. The ocean is a cradle of life on Earth. And however, it is only after 20 years at COP21 that the role of the ocean in the climate system was recognized. I would like to thank the Ocean and Climate Platform and all the NGOs that have long campaigned to repair this injustice. They have inspired my action as COP president. And for the first time in a COP, the ocean has been part of the action agenda. For the first time, the ocean has been part of a climate change agreement. For the first time, tens of side events on the ocean organized by civil society have taken place in the Paris conference. And for the first time, for example, several other governments have launched a joint campaign named because the ocean with Chile, Monaco, Morocco, and France. But future COPs on climate change will not be the same anymore. And I know that Morocco, with COP22, has decided to carry the torch. We have to act now and quickly so that the ocean continues to regulate the climate, so that we can protect the fantastic marine reservoir of life, because the ocean is a big part of the solution and an incredible source of blue growth and innovation for health, for food, for industry, and for renewable energies. And I fully agree with President Obama when he says, like yesterday, that the problem is we are asking far too much from the ocean, asking it to adapt to us. And to face this challenge, I believed that we have to answer to these three critical questions. Will we be able to build a blue growth without harm and destruction? Will we be able to build a sustainable blue development without causing degradation? In one word, will we be able to achieve with ocean what we failed to do with our land? Yes, it is possible, and that is why we are here together. And for all these reasons, I think that the ocean must be recognized as a common heritage of Manking. And now a few words of special responsibility of France. I know that France is present in every part of the ocean, with one of the largest maritime domains with on 11, million, 11 million square kilometers. I wrote two laws before the French parliament, one on energy transition and one on biodiversity that address maritime issues. When I was appointed minister on environment, energy, and maritime affairs two years ago, only 4% of the French maritime domain was protected. And I am glad to announce that we are now reaching 21%.
and I am announcing to this conference, our ocean today, the expansion of the marine reserve in the French Thousand Territories and the creation of a marine protection area around Clipperton Island in the Pacific Ocean. I had... I had inspiring discussions on Clipperton with Eric Salai from National Geographic here in Washington. And since France contains 20% of the world atolls, I have set the objective of protecting 75% of coral reefs by 2020. Another point, to prevent collisions between boats and sea mammals, we have required French vessels navigating in the Pelagos Sanctuary in the Mediterranean Sea and the Agua Sanctuary in the French Caribbean to be equipped with whale detection systems. And I call upon all countries to join these initiatives. Let me touch upon a major point about pollution. It is urgent to combat plastic pollution its impact over 80% of sea turtles and 90% of birds in the North Sea. I have banned single-use plastic bags in France as of July the 1st by a law. It has been a great fight to change behaviors. It is a great achievement today, but this is a global fight. We cannot succeed alone. And today, along with some other countries, we are launching an international coalition to ban plastic bags. And you must know there is a seven continent of plastic garbage under the oceans. As president of COP21 to end, I am happy to report to you some of the most significant achievement of the work during COP21 and after. First, the launch of a special EPCC report on climate and ocean, following the request by China, Monaco, Spain, and France. Second, an Arctic cooperation. Three proposals by France and its partners in the International Maritime Organization, Maritime Organization to reduce emission from shipping. A Mediterranean partnership uh, with the 21 countries all around the Mediterranean, a very fragile sea. Then the collaboration with the World Bank and other international donors to support West African countries in their fight against coastline erosion. Then the cruise initiative to equip with early warning systems, small island states and vulnerable countries affected by climate disaster risks. The international initiative on sustainable small islands, a major climate challenge and a question of survival. All these initiatives are starting to form a robust and coherent climate action agenda to the ocean and they are an asset for the world community. The famous French navigator Eric Tabarly explains that to navigate is to accept the constraints we have chosen. It is a privilege. The majority of humans endure the obligations that life has thrust upon them. And the French poet Baudelaire said, free man always you will cherish the sea. So I can tell you, be free and love and protect our ocean. Thank you. Again, welcome to uh, historic Gaston Hall. It's quite a room, isn't it? Uh, we're delighted you could join us this morning. Thank you, Minister Royal, for your framing remarks and for sharing these exciting initiatives with us. 
Uh, we want to be able to get to some student questions, but we also want to hear the perspectives of our other panelists before we do. So each will speak for three or four minutes, setting out some of their views, their initial framing remarks about the challenges, the issues facing our oceans, how we should grapple with them. And then I have some questions from students on cards that we'll try to get to uh, as we move toward the next phase of our program this morning. Uh, but first, uh, Vice President de San Malo, um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, could you share some of your views on this critically important set of issues which is bound to be with us for years to come? Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity of, of sharing this wonderful auditorium with students. I couldn't agree more with Secretary Kerry and Segolen on their mention of the passion of the youth that we need to overcome this important and critical global uh, challenge. So I, I cherish the, the opportunity. And let me tell you a little bit about, about Panama and these three, four minutes that have been given and our, and our commitment and how we view ourselves. The oceans have been part of Panama's DNA forever. The very meaning of the word Panama means abundance of fish and butterflies. For those of you that do not know Panama, you can go from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean in about an hour's drive, about a minute's helicopter ride. So for us, we're not an island, but we are surrounded by oceans and, and, and our, our country looks to the ocean uh, for everything that we that we do. We see Panama in a way as, as a, the great connection. We emerged three mo million years ago as a landmass to unite two land masses. And when Panama emerged, this changed ocean currents, this changed biodiversity, this changed climate change. And we were bound to unite the oceans through our canal. And we connect the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean through the Panama Canal, contributing to maritime trade, reducing transit, reducing emissions with that uh, contribution. And we have forever been looking to the, to the ocean in this, in this regard. So we are committed to preserving our oceans. We are committed to uh, contributing to this quest and we are concerned about the challenges that we face. The, the conference yesterday was, was powerful, was enlightening and, with, and, and was worrisome as well because it, it is a major, a major challenge. So oceans define much of what Panama has been, what Panama is and, and what Panama will be and thus our commitment. And just to mention briefly a few of the things that we are doing, we have uh, surpassed Aishi's target. We now have 13.5% of our marine territory. And let me tell you, this is 31,000 square kilometers. And Panama total is 75,000 square kilometers. So what we have in marine territories is about half of our land territory. This is as of a decision of last year. We have a few days ago ratified the climate uh, Paris um, agreements, and we will be depositing next week at the UN the instruments, and we have as well ratified the port um, agreement. Uh, these are um, just contributions. We need to do much more. We need to um, combine our efforts. And uh, as once somebody said, how come we call this planet Earth when we really are oceans? And we need to look uh, ever more towards that, and, and, and this is only a, an effort that we will overcome by a coalition, a coalition of, of, of youth, of private enterprises, of civil society, and certainly of governments. And I ask, I ask you to take your passion uh, as young uh, leaders in order to mobilize ever more people in this quest that is uh, it's really a need for our sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to Minister Leuven. Thank you very much. And I also would like to first of all acknowledge uh, all you young students and leaders for being here. I'm really, really impressed to see the great interest in this topic and it really, really deserves this interest as well and it also uh, needs leadership. Um, we um, know that our ocean ecosystems are taking a very, very heavy toll because of human activity. 
uh, overfishing has led more than 70% of our fish stocks to be over, over or fully exploited, and we can't really uh, continue this trend. Pollution is now both when it comes to toxic pollution and plastic pollution that uh, Minister Royal uh, mentioned is really on a trend that if it continues, we will have three tons of plastic in the ocean for each uh, three tons, sorry, three. Uh, one ton of plastic for every three tons of fish in the ocean by uh, in 10 years' time. And this is really something that cannot continue. And we need to have more cooperation. We need to take leadership on this issue because we can't do it later, because later it will be absolutely too late. Um, personally, I actually got into politics because of the, the issue of uh, ocean degradation and in particular overfishing. And this led me to uh, writing a book about it and uh, then I entered politics. So I spent five years in the European Parliament working very, very actively to reform the European common fisheries policy. And I can tell you all young students that when I started, I wasn't really sure that I could make a change or that we could make a change. The system seemed so impossible to influence and it was so many economic interests in it. But we actually made it. We could reform the common fisheries policy, which now really sets out the principle that uh, setting the quotas for fish, uh, fishing must follow scientific advice and also that the very destructive practice of discarding bycatches, and, and, uh, which is somehow somewhere around 25% of all the fish that get caught is now banned in the European Union. So I know that we can make a change and we should not ever, ever lose hope. Uh, I think one of the greatest things that gives us hope now is that we have a global agenda, the, glo the Agenda 2030, that uh, where we leaders around the world have agreed to really have sustainable and healthy oceans by 2030. We have a lot of instruments, a lot of conventions have been signed over the years, uh, but we see a very, very big lack of implementation. And the only way to address that when it comes to the oceans, that covers 72% of the worlds of the globe, is international cooperation. Not even Sweden, my country, can do it alone because we're so dependent on cooperation across borders because oceans don't have borders. So we need to really uh, step up the efforts to have really uh, good cooperation also with uh, the private sector. And I'll give you one example. Last year, the emissions of sulfur re were reduced in the Baltic Sea, which is the sea that is next to Sweden, uh, by 88%, just in one year. And that was after the EU regulation on sulfur, the sulfur directive finally got into place where there were much stricter regulations for um, the, uh, uh, the vessels in the Baltic Sea than in the rest of the world. And why is that? Because the Baltic Sea is much, much more sensitive due to its, uh, very, uh, it's a very shallow and also brackish water. And this shows that with regulations, but we need to to have the same regulations all around the Baltic Sea because Sweden can't do it alone. We need Finland, we need, we need Poland, we need Germany, we need Russia. And uh, now we got that in place and that also shows that we can make a difference. Last point, next year um, in June, there will be a first UN conference on the SDG 14 on oceans uh, in New York and Sweden is hosting it together with Fiji and the small island states. And this will be the first big opportunity to bring, bring together all the countries, all the stakeholders, to make commitments on how we can cooperate better in order to fulfill SDG 14 on sustainable oceans. Then we need to bring together 
the, the private sector, uh, the NGOs, all the countries, all the regional organizations, and see how we can link together what's happening on land to what's happening in the ocean, and really make the commitments that are needed so we can save our common heritage, as Minister Royal was saying, because it is really our common heritage, the oceans. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Minister Malkora. Thank you. It's great to be here, and it's hard to be the last one after so many friends and colleagues have been so eloquent about the situation. Let me start by, by saying that it may be a great significance that we are having this conversation here in Georgetown University. I have learned, and I'm going to read it to make it sure I say it right, that the motto of the university is Utraque Unum. And this means both into one. And I think there is a lot of meaning behind this related to oceans. Because as it was said, none, none of us can do this alone. We are all into one. It's one big ocean that covers almost 80% of the planet Earth. So why I feel that it's so unique to be here with you, all the students, carrying this torch. Because as Segolan said, we already have a framework of climate change. The COP21 was a great success, and we agreed to that. Some of us will be depositing the instruments next week, committing fully to, to the climate change uh, agreement. COP21 was a success, but it was also a success, Agenda 2030, which for the first time talked about sustainability in development and talks about North telling South not, is about all of us complying, it's a universal agenda. So what is needed? What is needed is delivering results. And you just said it. And why is so important that you are engaged in delivering results? Because the passion, the energy, the, the clear vision youth have into these matters should be the ones that pressure, that put pressure on governments, on civil society, on private sector, to get our act together, to do what we have committed to do. So it's not for lack of frameworks, regulations, that we will not get there. If we don't get there, it's because we don't do it. So youth are impatient. Youth want things get done now. Well, so does the earth, so do the oceans. So here we are together today, recommitting to what we have said. Let's make sure that you put pressure on all of us, the ones who happen to be in leadership positions, so that we really get it done, and we get it done now, because tomorrow may be too late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we have time for one question, and I've been sifting through the questions uh, to find one that builds on the theme that you just identified, Minister Makura, the, the role of young people. And here's a question um, from a Japanese student, Akashi Watanabe, who's here with us from Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. And it's for Minister Royal. It's a, it's a general question, but it has a specific angle. The question is, what specific advice would you give young people who want to work to help save the oceans. Specific advice. Very good question. Um, I would say first to read all the scientists has written about this problem. Because when uh, we can share uh, the knowledge and uh, the scientists lesson so we can understand. And when we understand, we can act. So if we want to, to gather the cleverness and uh, the willingness of action, we have first to learn of science. Because uh, during several years, we have skepticism 
And now no more scepticism, sometimes scepticism, <laughs> political exploited. And so uh, we have to be strong with uh, the knowledge about ocean. And now, and now we know that ocean is, uh, is uh, the principal, the most important victim of, uh, of rewarming. Uh, there are three, three kinds of, of, uh, of problems. The rewarming, the pollution, and the over-exploitation, and especially uh, overfishing. So we have to fight these three uh, problems for ocean and for earth. And secondly, we know that in the ocean is also the solution, because ocean is, uh, can catch uh, the, the carbon. Uh, ocean is 80% uh, of the biodiversity. And ocean uh, is the, the, the most important um, reserve of uh, blue growth for health, for industry, uh, for rare materials, and especially for alimentation. And you must know that nowadays 70% of the worldwide population uh, is living by uh, eating for what is coming out from the ocean. And tomorrow, here is a solution of the big problem of alimentation. Nearly at the end of the century will be 9 billion inhabitants, 9 milliards d'habitants sur la Terre. And how can the small earth uh, nourishing all those people? The, the solution is in the sea. But the important question is uh, if we are going to be uh, clever enough to uh, exploit uh, resources coming from the ocean without making what we did with the earth. And what kind of development we can imagine you are going, you are going to imagine, it's your generation which are going to imagine the new model of growth that can uh, bring uh, health care to the worldwide population without uh, hurting and without uh, uh, make, uh, make uh, bad things to, to the earth. And that is the fight of civilization, and I hope you will succeed to win this fight of civilization. Thank you. Well, that's... Um... <laughs> that is uh, an inspiring note on which to end. We've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. We really appreciate your presence, and please join me in thanking our panel. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to Georgetown and to Gaston Hall for this special gathering of the, our Ocean One Future Leadership Summit. And to the presenters and participants and students who have shared your insights, your expertise, and your knowledge as part of this summit, we're deeply grateful. Your efforts here will have a resonance that extends far beyond this gathering. We're deeply grateful to the Honorable John Kerry, the United States Secretary of State, for leading us in this conversation today and for creating this summit. We're also joined today by Her Excellency Isabel de Saint Malo de Alvarado, Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Panama. Thank you for your presence. I also wish to thank our panelists from our session that just concluded. Her Excellency Isabella Loven, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for International Development Cooperation and Climate of Sweden. Her Excellency Susanna Malcora, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship of Argentina. And Her Excellency Sigalen Royal, President of COP21 and Minister for Environment, Energy and Marine Affairs of France. I also wish to thank Secretary Kerry and the State Department, our School of Foreign Service, our Science, Technology, and International Affairs program, our student-led Georgetown Sustainable Oceans Alliance, and our university-wide Global Futures Initiative for working to bring us all together today. 
It's a great honor to welcome Secretary Kerry back to the Hilltop for today's discussion and to recognize his extraordinary leadership in support of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which was signed by the United States this past April and ratified by our country less than two weeks ago. We're also pleased to be joined today by Adrian Grenier, an actor, director, and environmental advocate who co-founded the Lonely Whale Foundation, which supports organizations and communities working toward the common goal of ocean preservation. Dean Joel Hellman, the Dean of our School of Foreign Service, will moderate today's conversation with our distinguished guests. We're extraordinarily grateful for their presence here today, and it's my pleasure now to welcome them all to the stage. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see such an enthusiastic crowd. Um, let me welcome Secretary Kerry, Adrian Grenier. Thank you for joining us today as the part of the first ever Our Ocean, One Future Leadership Summit. We've got a limited time. I've got a pack of questions um, that you've already given me in advance. But I'd like to just get things started uh, by asking the Secretary. Um, as Secretary of State, you've been deeply committed to elevating the global response to environmental issues like climate change, ocean protection. These aren't issues that have been traditionally at the top of the foreign policy agenda. Could you start first by explaining to the audience why you view the ocean as a top global policy priority? Uh, absolutely, but let me begin by saying thank you to you, Dean. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir, for inviting us here. Thank you, Georgetown, for providing such a terrific uh, forum over the last couple of days. Thank you to Adrian, who was with us last night. Uh, and I really want to thank my fellow foreign ministers here, Isabella, Isabel, Segolin, and who else do we have here somewhere? I thought we had someone. Uh, Ingrid. Third. Susanna. No, somewhere. Where is Susanna? She was here. I didn't see her, but I know Susanna was here. Anyway. Uh, and by the way, note all women, folks. Uh, <laughs> Could be a harbinger of things. No, I can't go there. <laughs> I'm not allowed to go there. Um, <laughs> let me just uh, let me answer the question, and thank you all for coming here. The answer is really very simple. I've been involved in this issue now since I was uh, freshly returned from Vietnam, which is a long time ago now, way back in 1969-70, and I became involved in the first Earth Day. And through the years, as chairman of the fisheries subcommittee and as a participant in the various uh, conference of the parties under the UN climate change efforts. And Segolin was, was the president of COP21, which succeeded in doing the Paris Agreement. There has always been not a well-recognized, but for those involved in the issue, a clear, uh, inescapable connection between climate change and oceans between criminal activity, human trafficking, narcotics trafficking, gun running, and other things, criminal enterprise, which carries into the oceans in terms of illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, which is strip mining the oceans and threatens to destroy an entire ecosystem. Uh, the connection, obviously, of acidification, the increased carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions come back, fall in the ocean, and so we see massive amount of uh, black carbon in the, in, in, in the Arctic, which increases the melting of the ice, increased uh, acidification, which is 25 times what it was 50 million years ago. And we don't know the consequences completely, except that we do know that crustaceans are affected by the increased pH, the increased acidity of the ocean. And that can threaten <clears throat> the life cycle. We have almost 50% of the planet dependent on food from the ocean, on protein. We have 12% of the world's workforce 
depends on the oceans for their livelihood, for their work. And that's without even getting too far downstream in terms of the economic food chain. So when you look at what is happening with the combination of pollution, uh, just as an example, the, you know, the farms we depend on for our food also produce enormous amount of nitrate. Uh, the nitrates flow from the Missouri into the Mississippi down through the Delta, and we have a huge several hundred mile dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi where nothing lives, nothing will grow, nothing survives. And we now have more than 500 dead zones around the planet. So when you add up the level of illegal fishing, the destructive force that has, you know, there's <clears throat> human trafficking is a modern form of slavery. And there was a story I remember reading this last year, which really affected me in the New York Times front page story of a young Cambodian boy who was lured to Thailand with the promise of a job. He wanted the job, he went to Thailand. He was kidnapped and put on a vessel, a shackle around his neck for two years, fishing illegally in order to provide for the illegal product that would come into a port and be illegally sold. So we're doing, we're, we're doing things about that. When we started this Our Ocean Conference two years ago, only 10 countries in the world had signed on to the port state measures, and you needed 25 countries in order to make it law. Now, today, as we come here again for this session, we have 60 countries have signed up to the port state measure. And so, uh, so the answer, the short answer to your question is, caring about the oceans, understanding the connection of the oceans and what we do with plastic and pollution and overfishing and climate and energy policy is absolutely a security issue for every country in the world. If we don't pay attention to it, we will magnify the degree to which we're already going to experience climate refugees, massive problems and challenges to food security, as things that grow in one place today don't grow there anymore, or as the fish that people rely on for protein disappears. So this is life and death. This is national security. It is international security. And if we're going to respond to the challenges globally, we have to care about the oceans, and we have to understand the linkage to science and the linkage to climate change. It's that simple. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Adrian, Adrian, let me ask you on a similar note. What led you to devote so much of your effort and time to this cause? <coughs> Uh, well, it's simple. I've been listening to John Kerry. I mean, are we all not converts now? I mean, of course. Uh, I, I've been committed for a long time to root causes and um, fundamental solutions to m many different issues. So for me, it's environment, it's health, it's education. These things affect so many others. They're fundamental to so many other things. And if we can solve for them or protect them, then we'll just eliminate many other problems. So that's from my perspective. And I think the oceans in particular are fundamental to the environment. So I started to focus on the oceans. And I, I grew up in New York, right? And I, you know, I'm not too far from the ocean. And when people ask me, did you, know, did you grow up by the ocean or on the ocean? I said, no, I grew up in a concrete jungle. And that was my experience. So the oceans were so out of sight, out of mind for my everyday experience. And I realized that that's true for so many others. So many other people have that same experience, even though we own the oceans, even though they are ours, we don't have that fundamental connection or sense of ownership. Uh, so when I was introduced to the story of the loneliest whale in the world, he's a whale who migrates up and down the Pacific coast uh, calling out at a, a, a frequency that is unlike any other whale. So he speaks at 52 hertz, and no other whales speak that particular frequency. And so knowing that whales are sentient and highly social, they have spindle cells just like us uh, that are associated with consciousness, and, and he's been calling out his whole life without once receiving a response, I immediately felt empathy, I felt a connection for this particular whale, and I realized his calling out, his disconnect is a symbolic reality for my reality. I'm 
utterly disconnected from the oceans. So uh, I started the Lonely Well Foundation as a way to bond people together and connect them more with the oceans. Because if we can't connect, we can't care. And so for me, let's focus on root causes because they actually can solve for a lot of human things economically and just even just the spirituality of having that experience actually improves a lot of health conditions um, and in, as, as, an, as an inspiration as well. And then let's connect each other so that we can bond on common goals and, and solve them together. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We've been so fortunate here at Georgetown. Uh, over the last two days to host students from over 50 countries thinking about ideas, innovative ways of addressing these challenges. Um, and many of the students, of course, here are in the audience. We ask them to give us a set of questions. We have a lot of questions. We're not going to get through them all. Um, but what I'd like to do is I, I'm going to ask from the cards. I'm going to ask the student um, who gave the question to stand up so we can see who you are. First is Cindy Tran here. Cindy? Yeah, wave. <laughs> Cindy's from Georgetown, class of 20, and she asked to both of you, if you could give one piece of advice to my generation about sustaining and protecting the environment, what would it be? Secretary Kerry. Uh, don't be scared to take a risk and be engaged and, and pick a project, pick a target, and go after it. Um, I, and I'll just, a very quick story, I shared this with some folks who were at our thing last night. In 1970, I became engaged in, as I mentioned, the, the first Earth Day. 20 million Americans came out of their homes on Earth Day because mostly students organized a national moment to reflect on what was happening to the environment. But the, it didn't end with the 20 million coming out on that day to demonstrate because they wanted to not live next to a cancer breeding dump or watch the Cuyahoga River light on fire again. So they then focused on Congress. And they targeted 12 congressmen who were the worst votes in the United States Congress. And they labeled them the dirty dozen. And in the course of the campaign, seven of the 12 were beaten, 1972. In the aftermath of that, suddenly, because of this student movement, the environment became a voting issue. And that voting translated into people running for cover in the Congress by passing the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and ultimately the EPA, which President Richard Nixon, who was not known to be a leading ardent environmentalist, signed into law. That's how we got the EPA. So it's an example of what happens when you create accountability in the system. Now, I know there's a lot that you look at today that's a turnoff. I get it, but the system won't fix itself and you won't get what you want unless you are willing to put your head down and plow through it and be determined picking that target and get it done. And if you do that, you know, what Robert Kennedy said, that great message he gave in South Africa when people were fighting apartheid and he talked about, you know, the, that each person can make a difference and all together they create this ripple, then the ripple builds out into a mighty current that sweeps down the biggest walls of oppression and resistance. That's what happens. One ripple, one moment. And, and each of you has that power, I promise you. Adrian. There isn't one solution. There, there's no panacea that's going to solve all of the world's problems, the oceans, the environment. There are as many solutions, as many possible opportunities as there are people in this room, as there are people around the world. So I would just say, commit yourself to the oceans every day. It's a lifestyle change. Give us, give the oceans your mental energy, your heart energy every day and change the way you decide to commit to your world and your vision of the world. And it's okay if you have a small idea or if you have a big idea, if you're committed every day and you put a little energy towards it, 
you will add to the collective amount of solutions that will all come together to, to solve the problem. Don't feel like there's just one thing you can do and you check it off the, the list and you're done. It's not. It's a whole life of commi committing to the oceans. Let me... Thank you. Is, is Mary and Salu from Estonia here? Mary. There she is. Hi. Hey, Mary. Mary. Mary asks, what's been the most challenging issue that you've had to deal with on climate change? Uh, <laughs> well, I was, uh, you know, I, it, I was tempted just to say ignorance. Uh, people who want to ignore science. Uh, years of science. I mean, after all, we still have people who have uh, run for president of the United States who don't acknowledge <laughs> that there's a problem. Um, last July was the hottest July in recorded human history. But the month before that was the hottest month recorded history. In fact, all 12 months of last year were the hottest 12 months of recorded human history. And they make up 10 years that make up the hottest decade in recorded history. And the decade before that is the second hottest in recorded history. And the decade before that is the third hottest in recorded history. Do you begin to get it? <laughs> uh, some people don't. And, and so I suppose they believe that whatever extra water there is from the ice melting in the Arctic and Antarctic will just spill over the sides of a flat earth or something. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the problem is that uh, we're in a race against time. That's what science tells us. Not politics, not hyperbole, not uh, surmise, but facts. And you all remember the old saying, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And so this has been a challenge because I led the effort to try to get a trading system in place for, uh, in the Senate, uh, before I became secretary, obviously, to try to get a national program to deal with a market-based mechanism to reduce emissions so that the marketplace would really set the price for carbon and we could begin to trade. And, and you really could have had huge reductions. And we actually had the nuclear industry of America bought in. We had the electric industry of America bought in. We had uh, the environment community, the faith-based community. People really got it and were ready to move. But then the coal industry started advertising, scaring the hell out of some of my colleagues in the Senate. And we could only get to about 55 votes. We could never break that 60 vote margin. So we failed to get what in fact provided the solution to acid rain in the 1980s, which is a trading mechanism that reduced the sulfur that we put out. You don't talk about acid rain today. It didn't destroy our economy, far from it. We have never ceased to grow even when we regulate intelligently. And so the greatest challenge is getting over this hurdle in America that we particularly face in our media structure of being able to build consensus around facts rather than mythology or scare tactics uh, or uh, you know, theories for which there is not one peer-reviewed study versus 6,000 or so peer-reviewed studies that document what's happening on climate change. That's been the battle. It's a battle versus just a fundamental resistance to reality. Uh, and the increased difficulty we face in American politics of building consensus among the voters because of this, you know, multiplicity of outlets from which people get information and the lack of capacity to have a sort of focused, concentrated debate. That's, that's the challenge. I have a question for Adrian from David Wilkie. Is David here from the college, Georgetown College, class of 2019? There he is, David. Do you think that President Obama's recent designation of the first underwater national monument is a step in the right direction? 
And how would you like the next administration um, to continue or not continue down the path? Well, absolutely, it's a step in the right direction, but we have so much further to go. So I'd like the next administration to uh, increase the amount of water space by tenfold, uh, at, at least. Um, and, and it's not easy. I mean, I think it's, it's one thing. It's a, it's a great step in the right direction that we designate an area protected. But I think we also need to look at policing. How are we going to actually make sure that that area is, is taken care of? And I think that has to do with uh, public connection to uh, what is theirs and, and an outcry if it's not being protected. Uh, if your neighborhoods are, are falling apart and if there's crime, you know, you, you get up and you say something, you call the police and they show up to, to protect, but the oceans don't have a 911. Uh, we, don't, aren't, we don't even know the amount of destruction that's been done out in the oceans, in the open oceans in particular. So I'd like to see uh, more money put towards actual uh, policing of those marine protected areas. Thank you. We've got Sarah Trains, um, a graduate student at the George Sun School of Foreign Service. Is Sarah here? Hi, Sarah. She asked the secretary, um, as the Obama administration comes to a close, what are your proudest accomplishments in respect to climate change and ocean conservation? And what's the greatest challenge you think facing the next administration? Papaha no mu kuakayu. Do you know what that is? That's the largest marine reservation in the world that President Obama just created when he went to Hawaii and then went out to Midway Island. And it is, uh, it uh, builds on, on, on an already designated area, but it is enormous set aside. Now, at this conference that we're having in the course of this afternoon, we will have additional commitments. But I can tell you right now that we have more than 12 additional marine protected areas that are gonna be announced or have been announced. We are setting aside, uh, I think we were at 3.3 million uh, square kilometers this morning. Uh, that has grown. I don't know what the final figure is going to be, but I can tell you this. In the first ocean conference in 2014, we got pledges and commitments of 1.8 billion. At the second one in uh, Valparaiso in Chile, uh, we had 2.2 billion, so that's 4 billion. And in today's final tally, I do know we will be at 4.8 billion twice what we had for the two prior conferences in commitments to ocean conservation and so forth. The Packard Foundation today stood up and committed a five-year plan of $550 million. The Oak Foundation, $100 million. The uh, Walmart, Rob Walton of Walmart, produced $250 million. I mean, it's an extraordinary commitment by people, and this is now building. And I think that's, that's a significant accomplishment, the administration, to be galvanizing this kind of... Uh, activity. We're cre we've announced in what's called the Safe Ocean Network, which is a network now still loosely cobbled together of uh, Sea Watch and Ocean Watch and different entities that are watching where ships are, tracking fishing vessels, uh, and you can have real time. You can go actually and uh, see this on your own computer. Just Google it and go into Sea Vision or Sea Watch or whatever and you can begin to trace what's happening. But we're gonna to try to connect this as an enforcement mechanism using NASA, using militaries, military input, Coast Guards, police, environmental police, so that our goal is to make certain that there is no area of the ocean where illegal fishing can take place, where unaccountable fishing can take place, and we begin to gain accountability over this absolutely precious, vital resource. 50% of the oxygen that you breathe, we breathe as humans, essential for life itself, comes from the ocean. The ocean is the world's climate thermometer. It's, it's, it's the regulator, if you will. It sets the, you know, El Nino. It sets the climate change. Storms nowadays are far more intense because of what's happened with climate change. The ocean plays a critical role in that. The ocean is also the great sink what we call a sink. It is the absorber of carbon dioxide. And the ocean has now absorbed about 30% of the total carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution. And we don't know 
how much it can take. We do know that there have been signs of ocean regurgitation of carbon dioxide in the Antarctic that was measured. So it may be that it's at maximum. And if, is it, if it is at maximum, what does that mean in terms of the rate of growth of temperature as a result of where we are? And, and this is why people are predicting this, this curve, this hockey stick uh, of transition and the tipping point. We're, and it's why we're trying to keep the global warming level up, uh, uh, held to two degrees centigrade, but we're nearing that close enough now that we already know we may be into just, we may just be locked into mitigation and not prevention. That's what creates the urgency for this. So I think the, the most important thing the Obama administration has done is put its mouth where it, it put its put its money where its mouth is, worked on absolutely following through with designations. And President Obama, I can tell you today, is 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 number one among all the presidents in American history in setting aside both water bodies and land in order to preserve it for future generations. And that's what we're proud of. Thank you. We, I'm afraid we have time for just one last question to you both. Um, it comes from Alex, San, Alex Yamron. Is Alex here? Hi, Alex. He's a senior in, in, at Georgetown, and he asks, how do we build on the Paris Agreement to ensure that even as negotiations press further in the future, countries don't backslide on their commitments? And in particular, linking to another question um, that was also raised, what can young people do to keep countries to their commitments? I'll ask both of you. Well, let me, let me begin by, I want to thank Ségolène Royale and I want to thank France and, and Paris for hosting a, a superb conference. Uh, and President Hollande put himself uh, four square behind this effort. Uh, it, it, it was uh, complicated. We spent several years working to lead up to it. I'm proud to say that uh, another accomplishment, actually, in terms of trying to make this happen, uh, that uh, I went to uh, China in the very first months of my being secretary, and we made an agreement with China to create a working group with the intention of having our presidents be able to stand up to announce our common goals to move towards the Paris Agreement. And so a year later, President Xi and President Obama were able to stand up together and announce our intended reduction levels. And the reason this was so critical is that in Copenhagen, only the few years earlier, we failed at the Conference of the Parties to come to a meaningful agreement. And China was leading the charge along with the, G, you know, the rest of the less developed world to prevent this from happening. So bringing China on board was critical to being able to change the entire paradigm. And with that change, other countries began to come aboard. So that we are now in a place where we believe we can bring the Paris Agreement into force this year. And I am convinced from the conversations I've had with countries over the course of the last months, there are a number lining up to come on board. We will have a number of announcements in New York during the course of this next week where countries will sign on, and we are getting closer. We have to have 55% of the world's emissions contained within at least 55% of the countries that have signed the agreement. And that's when it takes force. We're now over, I think, 40%, nearing the 50. We can march up to the 55%. And if some of the countries that I think are going to come on board over the course of the next months come on board, we will be there and it will be in force. Why is that important? Because when it takes force, we have a review mechanism that was built into this agreement where every country has its individual plan, which is the common but differentiated responsibility, but every country has to be serious about its plan. And the review process brings us all back together where countries have to submit, this is requirement, what they've done to accomplish what they said they were going to do. And there's a retooling, recalibrating required if they haven't been meeting what they said they were going to do on a voluntary basis. So that's the accountability measure. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure here, but there's also a lot of just basic political accountability that exists here. This is becoming more and more every day a voting issue. 
and populations are going to hold their governments accountable. China, the population of China really cares about this issue. And it's one of the reasons the Chinese government felt they had to move, because to not move might have created instability. I think that's a growing movement around the world where people are feeling the increasing heat, feeling the reactions to increased intensity of storms, feeling drought, seeing the increased fires and the intensity of the fires. And, and there's just a, you know, intuitive cognitive uh, transformation taking place, which uh, in my judgment is going to help to create accountability in the Paris process. So I think we're at a transformational moment, but it's only by what Adrian was talking about and I was talking about earlier, by all of you being sure to not just attend Gaston Hall today, make sure that you're going to translate this and every one of you has a fundamental responsibility to vote. I, you know, I do care who you vote for, but I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not allowed to get involved in the partisan process. You decide who you're going to vote for, but you have a fundamental responsibility to vote. And I'm telling you, in presidential elections that have been decided by chads in Florida, by a few hundred votes, my presidential election, 59,000 votes in one state was the difference. Folks, it makes a difference whether or not you vote. Please, thank you. Uh, we, we need to change who we are as a culture. We need to reevaluate how we imagine the future, our future to be. And I think change what we value and we have to recognize that we are part of this interconnected global community and we have to act accordingly. You know, I spent eight years on a show that promoted conspicuous consumption and immediate gratification without any long-term consequences. I mean, if you've ever seen Entourage, did you notice that we never had hangovers? <laughs> if you lived that lifestyle in reality, you'd have lots of hangovers or be dead. Um, but of course, in the reality of television, there are no consequences, but in the real world, there are. So I think we need to start thinking long-term, not in quarters and years, but recognize how our behavior uh, affects our children and in the future. And I think if we change what we value uh, away from materialism and just con uh, conspicuous consumption, but we start to re-divert re it towards what's really valuable and the preciousness of the planet, I think that the future that we all will enjoy is going to be that much better. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think you look like you're Let me just say, uh, on behalf of the audience, on behalf of everyone at Georgetown University, how privileged uh, we are to have first uh, an extraordinary panel of ministers join us here today. Um, uh, Adrian Grenier, Secretary Kerry, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to hear from you, to learn from you, to engage with you, and to be inspired by you. So thank you very much for coming to Georgetown, um, and we wish all the success to the Our Oceans Initiative. Let me first ask you to join me in thanking them. And if I could just ask you to please remain seated while the Secretary um, and Adrian Grenier leave the stage and our distinguished guests in the front row depart. Thanks, everyone, for coming.